final speaker in this first panel is uh, Will White from uh, the University of York. Uh, Will completed his uh, Oxford uh, thesis uh, in 2020 and he's currently uh, a Lee Hume Early Career Fellow in the Department of History um, at the University of York. Um, his project um, for his postdoc explores the ways in which peace was pursued, debated and reconceptualised during the violent upheavals of the 1640s and 50s. Uh, he's already published some of this research uh, in an article in Historical Research, uh, Making Peace in the English Civil Wars, which was the winner of the Pollard Prize, uh, was originally presented at um, British History in the 17th Century Seminar, and possibly at other values as well. Um, he's got another article forthcoming in the English Historical View, Review, and his first monograph, uh, The Lord's Battle of Preaching, Print and Royalism During the English Revolution, uh, will be published in March with uh, Manchester University Press. Um, if you want more details about that, talk to Will himself. Uh, we, uh, and he's going to be talking to us today about radical neutralism uh, and the English Revolution. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks to Rasim and John for, for inviting me to speak. Um, neutralism might, at first glance, seem a slightly incongruous topic for a paper at a Christopher Hill conference. After all, it was Hill's revisionist critics seeking to deflect attention away from, quote, obscure left-wing fanatics, who tended to stress the widespread reluctance of contemporaries to take sides after the outbreak of civil war. This was held to confirm the deficiencies of Whig and Marxist teleologies, and thus the adjectives most often used to describe neutralists were apathetic, ignorant, localist, conservative, or self-interested. By contrast, other scholars happier to integrate ideological conflict and popular politics into their interpretations of the civil wars, have sought to excavate core allegiances concealed beneath neutralist rhetoric. Anthony Fletcher has argued that peacekeeping initiatives in 1642 could simply be stratagems by one side to gain time, while both David Underdown and Mark Stoyle have shown different clubman groups in the southwest during 1645 to have had discernible preferences for either king or parliament. But if this would seem to leave us with a slightly unsatisfactory choice between non-partisans as either disengaged or disingenuous, Gerald Aylmer and Anne Hughes have drawn a more nuanced picture, acknowledging an authentic constituency of neutralist opinion while refusing to conflate this with localism or apathy. My aim here is to develop this middle way and to probe a bit further into the, the ideas and identities of those who resisted side-taking. Scholarly interest in the clubmen has rendered neutralism something of an anomaly in early modern England in early modern historiography, with much more consideration given to its popular than to its elite and theoretical dimensions. When historians reconstruct a complex tapestry of political thought woven during the 1640s, for example, neutralist writing is almost never considered as a constituent thread. But this paper will suggest that there was in fact a good deal of printed literature produced after 1642 by those who positively identified as neutrals and sought to construct robust intellectual foundations for their non-alignment. Rather than simply keeping quiet and hoping to avoid the political fray, these writers were prepared to advocate publicly for neutrality as a principled position. More importantly, an opposition to war could sometimes prompt the Englishman to countenance political ideas and practices that represented a significant departure from the pre-war status quo. It may be, therefore, that neutralism is not as remote from the concerns of works like The World Turned Upside Down as one would instinctively assume. Sir Francis Neversole is now best known to historians as an early Stuart diplomat and letter writer. Born in 1587 to a minor Kentish family, he was appointed secretary to Elizabeth of Bohemia in 1619 and spent the next 15 years tenaciously attempting to advance the Palatine cause at the English court. An indiscreet remark um, about Charles I's lukewarm commitment to his brother-in-law's flight attracted the king's displeasure in 1634, and Neversole was thereafter forced to withdraw to his flight <coughs> at Polesworth in Warwickshire. This concern for international Protestantism reflected a lifelong aversion to popery, which Neversole seems to have combined with moderate support for ecclesiastical reformation and a conservative understanding of England's, quote, well-experimented government within ancient bounds. In the late 1640s, he would profess hostility to the utopian alterations proposed by the levellers and to the political programme of common soldiers and their agitators in the new model army. However, during the First Civil War, Nethersole steadfastly avoided taking sides and was briefly imprisoned in Kenilworth Castle for his refusal to contribute to the parliamentarian war effort. Moreover, he showed a consistent willingness to embrace the label neuter publicly. In 1659, he would explain how he had laboured during the preceding decades to avoid the great prejudice 
of being reputed partial. Elsewhere, he argues that, quote, neutrality is more agreeable to the duty of good subjects than partiality, while distinguishing neutrals from turncoats or time savers, who contribute to both sides for mere private respects. The latter he condemned as greater sinners than the partakers on either side, and denied that they could, quote, be properly called neuters. He labelled he labeled them instead utiques, that is, each of two. Nethersoul's decision to remain impartial was evidently informed by ideas about just war, and especially the writings of Roman commentators on the subject. He insisted, for instance, that it was, quote, unlawful for a Christian prince and his people to go to war one against the other for any cause that might have been determined by the law of the land without war. A marginal note, he referred readers to a passage in Livy's history in which war is described as only just and right on their behalf who have no way and means to avoid it. This was something that for Nethersoul, neither Charles I nor Parliament could claim, given that arbitration through existing constitutional channels had been, and remained, a possibility. Furthermore, since both sides regarded themselves as fighting, quote, a pure defensive war, there must be a great misunderstanding between them, and until this was resolved, no military action could be legitimate. A civil war between prince and people, he thus concluded, may be unjust on both sides. Rather than this stance encouraging passivity, however, civil war was the cue for Nethersoul to emerge from hibernation. He immediately devoted his energies to mediation and bridge building, to which his pre-war diplomatic career perhaps disposed him. In December 1642, he published the first in a long series of pamphlets that he hoped would help to bring about, quote, a speedy accommodation of the present unhappy differences between his majesty and the parliament. He also wrote letters to friends of influence around the country, receiving feedback on various schemes for national reconciliation, and ensuring through the targeted use of manuscript and print that they were circulated to members of parliament. The two pamphlets he penned during the winter of 1642-3 focused exclusively on the high politics of conflict resolution. Considerations upon the present state of the kingdom laid out a series of compromises on what Nethersoul perceived to be the central questions dividing the two parties. <coughs> For instance, there was to be a general amnesty for all delinquents initially, and it would then be left solely to such judges to whom by law it doth appertain to determine which individuals, if any, would face punishment. But Nethersoul was also ready to contemplate a measure of constitutional innovation to restore peace. For example, he recommended the establishment of a supreme judic judicatory that would be responsible for the final determining of all controversies, whether ecclesiastical or civil, that may happen between man, or man and man or between community and community, for the preventing of civil war. These proposals, of course, fell on deaf ears, and Nethersoul didn't publish again until the late summer of 1648, as the Second Civil War was approaching its bitter conclusion. At this point, he entered his most prolific phase as a pamphleteer, bringing out five publications between mid-August and December. However, the disillusioning experiences of the 1640s, with Charles I and Parliament repeatedly failing to reach a settlement of their own accord, seems to have prompted Nethersoul to reconsider both his peacemaking strategy and his audience. Rather than trying to broker compromise between royalist and, royalist and parliamentarian leaders, he now appealed down to the mass of ordinary people that had actually done, and might again do, the fighting. By showing the grounds upon which both sides had taken up arms to be spurious, he hoped to convert these militant followers to neutralism, and thereby avoid relying on a successful outcome to formal peace talks. Hence, his longest pamphlet from these months was entitled Problems Necessary to be Determined by All that Have Taken Part on Either Side in the Late Unnatural War. This was essentially a series of moral quandaries that Nethersoul hoped would, when properly considered, demonstrate to soldiers that sitting still was the only conscientious response to the competing claims that had been made on their allegiance. It was followed in November by parables reflecting upon the times, in which Nethersoul compared the quarrel between King and Parliament to a turbulent marriage and their supporters to household servants. Explaining this move to a more prosaic register, he observed that the rarity and greatness of affairs and accidents of state doth dazzle the eyes of men unaccustomed with the judging and handling of them. Rather than this being a reason to discourage popular interest in politics, however, Nethersoul was candid that he hoped, quote, to dispel this mist. The case for neutralism set out in the problems and parables centered on the just war concept of authorization. The most influential Roman and medieval just war theorists had agreed that it was never permissible for private individuals to wage war independently. They needed first to receive a direct command from a legitimate authority. St. Augustine had claimed that subjects could obey the military orders even of sacrilegious leaders, since it was the latter who would ultimately bear the moral responsibility for an unjust war. 
this tenet would be seized upon enthusiastically in the literature parliamentarians and royalists produced for their armies. The royalist preacher Edward Simmons, for instance, told, tro told troops at Shrewsbury in 1644 that a right commission makes the war itself lawful to the soldier, although it were underta undertaken by the prince upon unjust grounds. Nethersole, conversely, departed from this traditional understanding of authorisation. For him, it was not permissible to take up arms solely because a legitimate authority had instructed it. This was a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for participating <coughs> in a war. Rather, potential combatants had to be satisfied that the motivations of those in authority for undertaking the conflict were just. The problems flatly deny that those who, quote, engage themselves in an unjust war on just grounds, be thereby wholly absolved from the guilt of blood. It was essential, therefore, for people to scrutinise the statements of those in power, to come to their own determinations about the justice of a military course, and to disobey these authorities if their commands contravened the dictates of conscience. Echoes of this argument would soon be heard in an unexpected, or perhaps rather more expected, place. On the 23rd of August, 1648, just a week or two after the problems had been published, George Thomason received a copy of the pseudonymous pamphlet entitled The Bloody Project, very probably authored by the level of William Warwick. The Bloody Project reveals the full extent of Warwick's hostility towards the political and military leadership on both sides by late 1648. He had become convinced that neither King nor Parliament nor the army could be trusted to support the wide-ranging programme of constitutional and legal reforms that would protect the liberties of the subject. Alarmed that blood was thus being spilled to pull down one tyrant and set up another, Warwick made an impassioned plea for, quote, soldiers and people to stand still and lay down their arms. This neutralist moment in Warwick's career has passed without much comment, as far as I can tell. Nonetheless, it's striking that despite their very different backgrounds and priorities, Warwick's case against participating in the war, and particularly the discussion of authorisation, closely mirrors that of Nethersole. The Bloody Project similarly contended that determinations about the moral propriety of a conflict could not be left to those in authority, and that the soldiery would risk damnation if they fought in an unjust war. You are a free people, Warwin told his readers, not to be pressed or enforced to serve in wars like horses and brute beasts, but are to use the understanding God had given you in judging of the cause for defence whereof they desire you to fight. It was, quote, not sufficient to fight by lawful authority, you must be sure to fight for what is just. Attaining the requisite moral certainty in such complex cases, however, would be all but impossible. Warwin went even further than Nethersole in pointing out that for those who believe supreme authority to rest ultimately <coughs> with the king, king, lords, and commons, the notion of legitimate instruction to engage in, the, uh, sorry, the notion of authorization in a civil war was essentially nonsensical. How could any one of these issue legitimate instruction to engage in military combat by themselves? Thus, by undermining the defence that soldiers were merely following the orders of their superiors, Warwin, like Nethersole, hoped to construe wielding arms for either side as a morally hazardous enterprise and neutrality as the safest course of action. To conclude then, Nethersole was a neutralist of a kind that's rarely featured in accounts of the English Revolution, neither an apathetic localist nor a calculating partisan playing for time. Instead, his principled aversion to side-taking was based on a sophisticated engagement with just war theories. Moreover, rather than retreating behind town walls or county boundaries, it encouraged him throughout the 1640s to intervene in national debates and processes, refining his approach to conflict resolution and to print as the decade progressed. Perhaps most interesting for the present conference, however, is the way in which Nethersole began to undermine traditional assumptions about popularity and the Arcana in Peru. In a sermon of 1618, John Everard had strayed onto the question of what constituted just cause of war. Although never one to shirk controversy, Ever Everard stopped himself abruptly, deciding that it was not for every private man to make too curious a disquisition into the causes and occasions of the sovereign's command, reason of state and policy, sometimes enjoining secrecy therein. By contrast, in his desperation to convert militants to neutrality in late 1648, Nethersole not only opposed this kind of unquestioning obedience, but essentially made knowledge and interrogation of state affairs essential for salvation. He placed the duty of the individual to their private conscience above that to duly constituted authority, and stressed the fitness of ordinary people to investigate <coughs> the words and actions of politicians. Of course, Nethersole's promotion of popular politics only extended to decisions about taking up arms. But it's significant that almost all pre-war commentators, including the fiery Everard, had been loath to make even this limited concession, regarding it as potentially corrosive to traditional structures of and ideas about authority. 
Nether saw his neutralist activities thus sat somewhat uneasy <coughs> with the conservatism he expressed at other points in his career. On the one hand, he was suspicious of the recent politicization of the new model army. On the other, he, like the levelist in whom he also professed <coughs> hostility, sought to harness it for his own purposes and encourage soldiers' perceptions of themselves as conscientious, politically aware individuals. A mere mercenary army could not have been persuaded to demobilize in this way. So to relate all this more directly to Christopher Hill and radicalism, in a string of recent articles, Jason P.C. has argued, firstly, <coughs> that we should look to uncover radicalism in relation to everyday political practice, and secondly, that radical ideas, quote, proved capable of, mo of migrating into unexpected areas of the political nation. Hill himself seems to have been conscious of the latter point, grouping together two of his collected essays on Samuel Butler and the Earl of Rochester under the heading Radical Royalists. I wonder, though, if the relationship between radicalism and neutralism might also be worth pondering. While both royalists and parliamentarians <coughs> depict themselves as fundamentally conservative, even deferential, committed to obeying the dictates of a lawful power that, in the last instance, exercised sovereignty, those who refused to choose a side didn't have this option available to them. Neutralism necessarily involved disobedience to the commands of both king and parliament, and those who advocated it therefore had to think carefully about how it could be justified. For some supporters of the clubmen, at least, the answer was a radical construction of popular sovereignty. The clubman vicar of Coombe in Wiltshire thought his parishioners were entitled to take the staff of state into their own hands to defend their inheritance. Likewise, William Ball, who Richard Tuck sees as an apologist for the clubmen, insisted in 1845 <coughs> that the people had a natural right to defend themselves by force of arms if necessary against arbitrary tech attacks on their property by <coughs> the kings or parliaments. It's perhaps worth noting too that both the Neutralisation Pacts of 1642 and the Clubman Agreements of 1645 involved the adoption of a kind of quasi-Republican government at a local level. In essence, multiple versions of Patrick Collinson's Swallowfield emerged in the 1640s. But rather than self-government at the king's command, this was self-government at nobody's command. We might reflect then on how a desperate aversion to, aversion to conflict could push people into novel political practices and ideological positions with radical implications, and ask whether those most reluctant to take sides could nonetheless play a part in turning the world upside down. Thank you very much.